Okay, good morning everyone. So today we're going to finish up the chapter on volcanoes. This will be your last day with me. Dr. Larrick's going to take over for the last few class periods and talk about climate change. So we're going to finish up with volcanoes today. Um, last class we were going through some background on volcanoes. And the most important things to remember from what we discussed last class is that volcanoes occur when magma exits some sort of hole or opening in the Earth's crust. And that magma consists of four different things. You have melted rock. Specifically, you have melted silicate rock. Silicates are special because they consist of very strong bonds. So in order to break these bonds, you need a tremendous amount of heat. That's why magmas are so hot. The hotter they are, the more bonds break, and the easier it is for that material to flow. That means that its viscosity is lower, or it's more fluid is another way to think about it. The second thing that's in magmas are solid minerals. These don't affect the behavior of magma that much. They can make it a little more viscous if there's enough of them that bump into one another as this material flows. But basically they are there simply because there are minerals in the magma that have melting points that are still hotter than the very hot magma temperatures. The third component is one of the most important of the four is gas. When magmas are deep in the earth, they have about 5% gas. Most of that gas is water vapor. About 90% of it is water vapor. A few percent sulfur gases, a few percent carbon gases. But these gases are what gives the magma buoyancy. There's bubbles in the magmas that cause it to be less dense, rise up towards the surface. So these gases are important in making the magma move to the Earth's surface. Finally, there's xenoliths. These are the hitchhikers, the foreign rocks that the magma picks up as it moves towards the Earth's surface. It gives geologists a glimpse of what rock types are beneath the volcano. Um, and especially it can tell us about the mantle because sometimes magmas that originate in the mantle will break off pieces of the surrounding solid rock and bring it up to the surface. So that's about where we are now. We talked about magmas in more general terms. What we'll do first today is talk about a couple of specific types of magmas. Scientists love to have lots of different kinds of things. We subdivide and classify things to no end. But to me, it's easiest to think about magmas just being one of two types. And this first type I have listed here is what's called mafic magma, also known as basaltic magma. This is the stuff you see in Hawaii. Okay, if you go to Hawaii, you're going to see mafic basaltic magma. It's the most common magma type on Earth. Our seafloors, which cover most of the Earth, that's what they're made of. They're made of mafic magma. The material that comes out in Hawaii, mafic magma. If you look at the moon, on a night where you have a full moon, look up at the moon, those big, huge, dark areas, Ancient astronomers thought they were seas. They called them maria, term for sea. They're actually mafic dark lava flows, similar to what you get in Hawaii. Most of the surface of Mars, mafic magma. Most of the surface of Venus, mafic magma. It's the most common magma type, not only on Earth, but in the t entire solar system. The important things to remember about mafic magma is that compared to the second type of magma we're going to talk about in a minute, it has a low silica content. So it has less of the silica tetrahedron than the next type. And remember, these silica tetrahedron form really strong bonds. That's what makes the magma really thick and pasty. Since you don't have nearly as much of this material in a mafic magma, that means you don't have as many of these strong bonds in your melted material. So what that results in is a very fluid magma. 
compared to the other type. If you go to Y, you can see the stuff just flowing along the surface. Most of the time, it's at a walking pace. The fastest flowing mafic magmas that I've ever heard about occurred at a volcano in Africa where some lava flows came out of a very steep-sided volcano and descended upon a city in the middle of the night, and they flowed up to 60 miles an hour. But that's really unusual. Usually it's at a slow to brisk walking speed. So that's fluid compared to this other type that I'll show you in a minute. That's a very important property of the magma in determining how it's going to behave. Because if the magma is fluid, if it can flow easy, then any gas bubble that you have in your magma, and think about what a gas bubble wants to do in the magma, right? It's less dense than the magma. It wants to rise and get out, right? In this case, if the magma is fluid, it can do just that. It can rise through the fluid magma and escape. And then by the time the magma reaches the Earth's surface, a lot of its gases have been able to flow out of the magma and be released. So you don't have a lot of gas to create a big explosion. Explosions are therefore very rare, and you get eruptions that consist primarily, primarily of lava flows. So what you have here is kind of a flow chart of thought, if you want to think of it that way. You have a magma that has a low silica content, few strong bonds, that makes it very fluid, gases can easily escape, and you end up with lava flows. So if you can understand this, you can understand really all the background necessary to needed to understand how volcanoes erupt. Now just a observation, mafic magmas tend to be found in oceanic environments. Divergent boundaries or rift zones that we have out on the ocean floor, most of the volcanoes that are along those rifts produce mafic magma. So they tend to be lava flow producing eruptions. So our ocean floors are covered with these mafic lava flows. As well as oceanic hotspots like Hawaii. Earthquakes give us some idea of where this magma comes from. You can look at earthquakes that are given off by a volcanic eruption and use those to pinpoint how deep the magma was flowing from. And what we realize is that mafic magma tends to originate in the upper parts of the mantle. So it's a good bet that we are melting some mantle material that gives us a low silica magma, few bonds, very fluid magma, gas can escape, tending to get lava flows rather than explosions. And I'll show you some photos in addition to the one I have up on the slide right here, in a second. So any questions on how that works? I know it's many parts, but hopefully the arguments between each of the steps here are pretty straightforward. All right, we have another type of magma. It's called silicic magma. It's called silicic magma because it has a very high silica content compared to the mafic magma we just discussed. Since we have lots of silica in this magma, that means we have lots of strong bonds still in our liquid. Remember, you don't have to break every bond to create a liquid, just some. So there's still lots of bonds holding this together. Since you have so much bonding in your liquid, that means you have a very viscous magma. These things barely move. If you have a lava flow that's made out of viscous magma, it might move a foot in a day. It's glacial in its advance. This stuff is super thick and pasty. It just does not like to move very much at all. And if you have a gas bubble that happens to be stuck inside this magma, it wants to rise, it wants to get out of the magma, but it simply can't. The magma won't move out of the way fast enough for these bubbles to rise. Scientists have done calculations on how quickly a bubble can rise in this magma, and it's about a centimeter in a year. So if you have a bubble in there, it's essentially trapped. 
So since this magma can't give up its gas very easily, when it arrives at the Earth's surface, it has all these gas bubbles that are under extreme pressure. And what that does is it creates explosions. That's what an explosion is. It's a sudden release of gas that rips apart the material that it's contained in. So again, silicic magma, lots of silica tetrahedron, lots of bonding in your liquid. That creates a very viscous magma that gases can't escape from. Rather than getting lava flows like in the previous example, you end up with a gas-rich explosive magma. These magmas tend to be found in continental environments. These tend to be the more deadly of the two magma types. And, unfortunately for humans, this magma is common where people live. The other magma type, common in ocean environments where people don't live. This is common in environments such as coastlines on continents where people do live. It's also found at continental hotspots. So this is the kind of magma we would expect to find in Yellowstone, which is a hotspot in the middle of the North American plate. If we look at earthquakes associated with the eruption of this material, we find out that a lot of the magma is created in the deepest parts of the Earth's crust. So these two magmas originate by melting different materials. The basaltic magma is from melting the upper mantle, and the silicic magma is from melting parts of the lower crust. Yes, question. Okay, she asked why is silicic magma mostly found on continents, and why is mafic mostly found in ocean environments? It goes back to where they originate from. Where does mafic magma originate from? The mantle, right? In an ocean environment, how far beneath the surface is the mantle? It's not very far. If you remember back to our plate tectonics chapter, it's only three to five miles beneath the ocean floor. Here on the continents, that material is located 50 miles, 30 miles, tens of miles beneath the surface. It's a lot harder for that material to find a path through all of that continental crust. So here on the continents, it's difficult for that mantle material to get up to the surface, but stuff that either originates in the crust or changes while it's in the crust is more easily able to get up there. So it's just sort of a proximity to where the stuff is created. Any other questions? So again, these are probably of this chapter in terms of the science part, probably the two most important slides we'll go through because it gives you kind of a thought flow chart on how volcanoes behave based on where the magma originates and what its chemistry is. So mafic magma, runny, gases get out, you get lava flows. Silicic magma, stiff and pasty, gases can't get out, they build up pressure and you get explosions. All right, so now let's take a look at what comes out of a volcano. Volcanoes produce different things some of these things can be very hazardous for people. Lava flows and domes. I think if you ask most human beings what comes out of a volcano, the first thing they're going to say is lava flow. And it's true. Lots of volcanoes produce lava flows. But not every volcano primarily produces lava flows. So we're gonna look at the different types of products that come out, what sorts of magma they're associated with, what types of activity you would expect mostly on different parts of the earth. So lava flows and domes. Lava flows are just what they sound like. They're a liquid mass of lava that goes across the earth's surface. As it cools, it turns into rock. In this photograph here, this is Hawaii. 
This is a lava flow traversing a road in some subdivision. You guys have probably seen videos of houses getting engulfed by lava. A couple years ago, 2018, there was a huge eruption in Hawaii that wiped out several hundred homes. What's interesting, I always find this, and a lot of people don't believe me, but it's absolutely true. I'll, I'll go off on a tangent here for a second. A lot of times when lava is encroaching on a house, you will see a person standing there watching it. And that person is an insurance adjuster. And the way insurance works is that you can't get insurance against lava or any other sort of volcanic activity. If lava or a volcanic ash flow takes out your home, you can't get insurance for that. But what happens is as the lava approaches the house, if the lava touches the house and then it goes up in flames, you're not covered. But if the house goes up in flames before the lava touches it, then it's fire and you're covered. So there's gonna be a person standing there to figure out when did the house go up in flames? Did that lava actually touch it first? If so, then you're not covered. Or does the house go up in flames before the lava flow goes, gets there. And then it's called fire and then you're covered. Yeah, Claire. Active, uh, I think it's called active God. Some things in your insurance aren't covered. If you have, uh, in some areas of the country, you're not covered by floods. It just depends on how your insurance policy is written. Insurers don't want to insure houses that are close to the Hawaii volcanoes for losses caused by the volcano because it's a very real possibility and they'll lose too much money. <laughs> yeah, it makes perfect sense though if you're an insurance company and don't want to pay out a lot of money. So it's, it's really strange. Uh, but that's the absolute truth. If your house goes up in flames before the lava touches, good news for you. And there's actually been reports of people, they can see that the lava is going to get their house. They light it on fire before they leave. And if they're not, if people don't see them light it on fire, then they're good to go. Happens all the time. So, you know, make a rule. Humans are great at finding a way around it. So just a side light for you. Okay, so this is a lava flow in Hawaii. Some more lava flows here from Hawaii as well. Sometimes they move at a slow walking pace. These rivers of lava that sometimes come out near the vents, they can move pretty fast. You'd have to walk pretty quickly to keep up with them. They're hot. This particular type of lava, mafic lava, tends to erupt around 1150 degrees centigrade. That's over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. Stuff's really hot. Yeah, Claire. <laughs> she asked if, uh, if lava flows and other volcanic eruptions are an act of God, shouldn't all hazards be? You're making too much sense. <laughs> yeah, it would seem like, yeah. And, and why do you get insurance? You don't get insurance for like normal days when nothing happens to your house. You get insurance for the times where something unusual happens and your house gets destroyed. You would think that natural hazards should be one of those things. Some natural hazards are covered, some aren't. Insurance companies don't like to insure against water damage because it's super expensive. So a lot of places, floods aren't covered. In some places you can buy extra flood insurance, but you have to purchase it separately. Your normal policy might not cover it. It depends on where you live, depends on your insurance company, depends what state you're in. Each state has different insurance laws. So don't, don't ask me to try to make sense of insurance companies. I can't do that for you. Um, but I can tell you that some natural hazards get covered and others don't. I mentioned in the previous slide that mafic magmas tend to form lava flows 
and silicic magmas tend to cause explosions. The vast majority of times, that's absolutely true. Every once in a while, a mafic magma will explode. Sometimes the mafic magmas will get into groundwater and boil that water and they'll have a whole bunch of extra gas, steam in this case, to propel an explosion. But most of the times they're lava flows. Silicic magmas tend to erupt explosively because they're thick and pasty and the gases come out. But every once in a while we end up, and we don't know why this happens, but we can end up with silicic magma that just doesn't have much gas in it. It just doesn't have enough gas to create an explosion. That's its normal tendency, but in some cases there's just not enough gas there. When there isn't enough gas, then this material can get up to the surface and form a lava flow. But because it's so thick and pasty, it just can't go anywhere. So what it does is it tends to sort of pile up in one spot and form a lava dome. This mountain that you see in the middle of this photo is at Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens erupted back in 1980 very explosively. It blew the entire top off the volcano, left a big crater, and that's what you see in the background is the crater that was left by that big explosive blast. But then over the next six years, Mount St. Helens tapped into a really gas poor pocket of magma. It just didn't have enough gas to explode. So that material rose to the surface and just oozed out really slowly. Because it was so thick and pasty and viscous, it couldn't flow very far. So it just piled up in one spot. And over six years, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And in this photo, that dome is over a mile across and it's a thousand feet high. So it's really a mountain within a mountain. And that mountain within a mountain formed over about six years by these super thick, slow moving, pasty lava flows. So you can get silicic magmas that form lava flows, in this case, lava domes, but they're really rare. Most lava flows are mafic. Most explosions are silicic, but there are rare exceptions. Okay, we talked about the runny stuff, the lava flows and domes. Now we'll talk about the explosive stuff. Typically when you have silicic magma, it's so thick and pasty that the gases can't get out. Gas pressure builds up in the magma and eventually blasts it to pieces. And when it does that, it can create different types of material and different types of activity. This first thing I have listed is a vertical explosive, an explosion that sends material straight up into the air. Sometimes the volcanoes are powerful enough to send material a few hundred feet above the volcano. And in our biggest eruptions, the explosions are big enough to send material 100,000 feet into the atmosphere or more. And sometimes these eruptions can last days, weeks. It was reported that an eruption about 1,000 years ago on one of the Greek isles, Santorini, lasted almost a month. So these are sometimes really long, sustained, violent, brutal eruptions. This photo I have here is of a volcano in Mexico called Pericutin. This Mexican farmer was out tending his field one day and the whole place started shaking. And then it started sounding like gunshots were going off. And then he smelled gas. And this volcano ended up growing in this cornfield over the next five years and covered enough area that it would, if Greeley had been there, it would completely have covered Greeley. So sometimes these eruptions can be very long lived. So what comes out during these vertical explosive eruptions are a variety of different things. Ash is sand size, pulverized pieces of magma. It kind of looks like snow when it's falling out of the sky, but it's actually little rock chunks. 
and sometimes these rock chunks can be pretty warm. Lapilli is pea-sized pieces of explosive material that fall out of the sky. Even more unpleasant if you're in the area. Blocks are basically anything bigger than gravel. And sometimes blocks can be as big as this room. Mount St. Helens threw house-sized blocks 18 miles from the volcano. That's how powerful that eruption was. And Mount St. Helens wasn't a big eruption by historical standards at all. It was kind of a medium-sized eruption. Bombs are material that is thrown out of, out of a volcano, still molten. And when it comes back to the ground and hits, it's still somewhat molten and just sort of splats on the ground. Some of these things actually look like uh, cow crap. Sometimes they're called cow dung bombs. And finally, pumice is the highly inflated material that gets ejected from some of these explosions. You can see in this photo, this particular explosive column is only a few hundred feet high. That's pretty small by eruption standards. If you were standing there, it would be pretty impressive to you, but explosions get an awful lot bigger than this. This is kind of on the small side of things. This was Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens erupted in May of 1980. It was kind of a complex eruption. The first phase of it was a blast that went horizontally, and we're gonna talk about that next. That horizontal explosion lasted just a couple of minutes, it did a tremendous amount of damage. But then for the next 18 hours, this blast cloud went up into the stratosphere. So it was just a sustained jetting of material into the highest regions of our atmosphere. And then the jet stream carried this material all over the Earth. Measurable ash fell as far away as New York. Places that were within 100 miles received several feet of ash. And again, this was kind of a medium-sized eruption by historical standards. So bigger eruptions can be, make even a bigger mess than this one did. Here's another column from Mount Mayon in the Philippines. You can see the material coming off the top. This material went up to about 30,000 feet, so as high as uh, a lot of jetliners fly. Stuff comes out really rapidly. Remember what's inside of this is pulverized magma and rock. So as they bang together, the material gets broken up finer and finer and you end up with this fine ash that then gets carried by the winds. Sometimes there's so much collision, there's so many collisions between ash in these that it creates a tremendous amount of static electricity. And it's not unusual to see lightning bolts come jetting out of this. All right, this is, I would argue that this is the most dangerous of all natural hazards that we have on Earth. Our horizontal explosions, sometimes called pyroclastic flows. If you get stuck in one of these, you're dead. You're not a little dead, you're not nearly dead. You're completely dead. And they're not likely to find you either. Because what these are, are hot avalanches, and I mean hot. Over 1,000 degrees centigrade, nearly 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. They're hot avalanches. So they have rocks, pumice, and everything else they might pick up as they flow downhill. Trees and bushes that are igniting and burning. So if you get caught in one of these, you get simultaneously pulverized and vaporized at the same time. You are not gonna survive this. And they're fast. 
The slowest pyroclastic flows are somewhere on the order of 60 miles an hour. The fastest ones have been supersonic, over 600 miles an hour. So you're not going to outrun these. So this is a pyroclastic flow descending the slope. I think this is Mount Augustine in Alaska. So what you see here is kind of a, looks like a cloud moving downhill. Sometimes these things are called glowing clouds. But the scientific term is pyroclastic, pyro meaning fire, clast meaning rock. So it's a hot avalanche. So if you could strip away the sort of roiling cloud what you'd see at the very base are lots of hot rolling rocks. And as they roll and bounce and collide into one another, they chip off small pieces. The hot air makes that material rise up and you see the sort of boiling ash cloud that's associated with it. And again, if you get stuck in one of these, it's lights out. Here's another view of a pyroclastic flow. I took this photo in Russia. This is uh, Mount Kiziman in Kamchatka, Russia. This is from my campsite. Not the best campsite in the world. But it took about 20 seconds for this pyroclastic flow to descend from the top of this 10,000 foot peak to the base. So if you were on this mountain, there's no way you could outrun it. This is a pyroclastic flow from Mount Unzen in Japan in 1991. And you can see this car. There's actually video of this car driving about 100 miles an hour down a dirt road, trying to get away from the cloud that's traveling about 100 miles an hour towards it. The person did escape. They managed to get away. Um, you might get away if you're in a car. You're not going to get away running. This particular eruption killed 44 people, uh, 41 reporters and three geologists, including a friend of mine, um, Harry Glicken, who used to work with me at Mount St. Helens back when it was erupting. He was there leading a famous French couple who were studying the volcano, and one of these pyroclastic flows changed courses in the middle of the night and wiped out the hotel that they were uh, sleeping in, so ended up killing everybody that was there sadly the absolute worst example i know of a pyroclastic flow impacting people happened in the early 1900s in the caribbean on the island of martinique the capital city of saint pierre which is this area right at the base of the little triangle on the right. The triangle represents Mont Pelee. People didn't even know it was a volcano. It just looked like a large hill behind the city. The city had about 29,000 people. It was the capital. It's a French colony, which means that like most Caribbean islands, some European country settled there a couple hundred years ago basically took over the political workings of the islands. You have like the British Virgin Islands, the British colonized that. You have places like Curacao that the Dutch colonized. The French colonized Martinique. So if you were in the capital city beneath this volcano in the early 1900s, the mayor of the town would have been French. Most of the citizens would not have been French. It was estimated that only 25% of the citizens were French. The rest were native Creoles. And there was an election coming up. The reason that this eruption was so horrible, as it turns out, is all because of politics and bad politicians. So think about this for a minute, okay? You're a French mayor of the capital city of a colony where most people aren't French, okay? So there's this election coming up, and just in the middle of the night, this mountain that sits right on the edge of town starts acting up. Gases start coming out at first. It starts stinking. 
And then earthquakes start happening with greater and greater frequency and greater and greater magnitude. So now it starts stinking and shaking. And when you have that much gas coming out of a volcano, coming out of the ground, things that live in the ground don't like to stay in the ground. So rats, snakes started coming out of their holes in massive numbers and descending in on the city. So think about this for a minute. You're in this town. It's shaking. It's stinking. There's rats and snakes everywhere. Do you want to leave? Yes, you probably want to leave. Who is most likely to have the means to leave? The rich French people that live there or the poor Creoles? The rich French people, right? What if you're the mayor and you have an election coming up? You're a French mayor. Do you want all your French citizens to leave? No, because you're unlikely to win the election. So what do you do if you're that French mayor? The area is stinking. There's snakes everywhere. It's shaking. People are getting scared. What do you tell the people? Well, what this politician did, like a lot of politicians, he lied to them. Nothing to worry about. We have our best people on it. Scientists are studying this. In fact, none of that was happening at the time. Sadly, in the middle of the night, early morning, Mont Pelee unleashed a pyroclastic flow that went into the city and only three people survived. 29,002 people died suddenly and violently, including the mayor. There were three survivors. Two actually didn't get caught in the pyroclastic flow. One was a shoemaker who lived on the edge of the town and the pyroclastic flow just barely missed his place. Another was a small girl that was walking to her grandmother's place outside the city. She ended up falling in the ocean, trying to get away from the flows that were coming down and she was picked up by a ship. The best one though, I'll tell you about him in a minute, was a prisoner. He was thrown in jail the night before. He was the only survivor. We'll come back to him in a minute. But again, there were lots of warnings that something was going on here. Little puffs of ash coming out, lots of gas coming out, lots of earthquakes, snakes in the streets, rats in the streets, things that were in the ground, not staying in the ground. The local politicians, oh, there's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about, don't leave right before the election. The place was absolutely destroyed. There wasn't a building left standing except for one. So on the lower right here is the jail cell that August Cyprus was tossed into. Uh, he was arrested the night before because he was drunk and naked. And he was tossed in this cell. It had a door with a little tiny opening. And when the pyroclastic flows came in town, it completely engulfed this little cell. And hot, scalding air started pouring in this little window up there. So what August did is he peed on his clothes. They had given him clothes after he was naked all night. He peed on his clothes and shoved them in that hole to try to keep the hot air out. He was still severely burned. He was found three or four days later. Rescue crews, were, crews went into town trying to find any survivors. They didn't find anybody. And then they heard moaning coming from this uh, little place. And they got in there and found him barely alive. Um, and he ended up surviving. And to me, the best part of the story is that not only did he survive, he was kind of the town drunk, um, didn't have a job, apparently liked to be naked and walk around town loaded every night. But because of his severe scarring, the Barnum and Bailey Circus picked him up and toured him around the world as the volcano man. He would come out and show everybody his severe scarring and he made a good living the rest of his life being the volcano man. So I guess the moral of the story is, 
I don't know, being drunk and naked isn't necessarily a bad thing. There are some advantages, so if it ever happens to you, you can use this story. Say you're doing it for, you know, trying to preserve your life. Another example of pyroclastic flows, I mentioned this a little earlier, Mount Unzen in Japan. So what was happening at Mount Unzen, and in this upper right photo, you can see a really steep mountain with some white rock at the top. That white rock is a lava dome. And it was growing, growing, growing. And every once in a while it would get too steep and big chunks of it would collapse, roll down the volcano at high speeds, creating pyroclastic flow. And when these pyroclastic flows move downhill, they tend to follow river valleys, just like other flows do. So they would go down the river valleys and they'd go down the river valleys. And sometimes there were dozens of these a day they go down the river valley, and all the rock would start accumulating in the river valley. And as more and more pyroclastic flows occurred, the river valley got more and more full with rock debris. A couple of geologists and 41 reporters decided to go in a valley that was just around the corner from what you can see. A valley where the pyroclastic flows hadn't been descending. They thought they were safe. They were staying in a hotel there. But in the middle of the night, eventually the river valleys where the pyroclastic flows had been moving into became completely filled and the pyroclastic flows that happened after that changed their course and found a different river valley to go down. And it just happened to be the one where all these people were staying. So 40 some people were killed in the middle of the night, mostly reporters, two French volcanologists, Maurice and Katja Kraft, and an American uh, scientist, Harry Glicken, who used to work at Mount St. Helens. Yeah, question. What are the green bulges? Oh, these, uh, she asked, what are the sort of green bulges on the mountain? That's actually forest that's still remaining. The pyroclastic flows are going around them because they're a high spot. Remember I said a minute ago that the pyroclastic flows like to follow the river valleys? So you can see there is a river valley between those two green spots. The green spots are actually much higher and the pyroclastic flows won't climb up over it. They'll go down the river valley. So that was just an area that was left unaffected. And then that lower photo is what the pyroclastic flow looked like. It was early, early, early in the morning. Um, this was the one that killed the uh, 44 people. And maybe the most famous pyroclastic eruption of all time was Mount Vesuvius, AD 79, almost 2,000 years ago. So Mount Vesuvius, you can see it in the upper photo there. It lies several miles from Naples. Naples today has over 2 million people. You can see the small towns of Herculaneum by the coast and Pompeii on the southern flank of Mount Vesuvius. Mount Vesuvius started erupting, and then it started producing pyroclastic flows. And before the people could be evacuated, pyroclastic flows came into both Pompeii and Herculaneum and completely covered them. And if you go there today, you can actually see places where people were waiting to be evacuated they got hit by these pyroclastic flows. Their bodies were vaporized. And I don't know who discovered this, some archeologists, but they were apparently digging around in the ruins and they were finding all these holes in the volcanic ash. And somebody decided to pour plaster in them to see what it was. And it was actually the casts of people who were waiting to be evacuated. Their bodies were completely vaporized by the heat of the volcanic eruption. And they found dogs, they found people. Um, pretty gruesome scene. You can go there today and see the plaster casts of the unfortunate folks that lived in these small towns. Mount Vesuvius last erupted in 1944 during the height of World War II. There's great photos of US bombers flying past and erupting Mount Vesuvius. That particular eruption didn't kill anybody, I believe, but 80 Allied bombers 
flew into the ash cloud and were lost. Ash, volcanic ash and jet liners are a deadly mix. There's been several instances where large jumbo jets have flown into volcanic ash clouds and plummeted out of the sky. What happens, and you have to know a little about how jets work, is the way a jet works is that it heats air up to about 1100 degrees C. That rapidly expanding air is then jetted out the back of a jet engine, and that's what makes thrust for the jet to move forward. So the inside of a jet engine is over 1,000 degrees C. So if a jet's flying along and ingests volcanic ash that melts at about 1,000 degrees C, it's about the same temperature as the melting point, right? That ash will actually melt and coat the inside of the jet engine and shut it down. In 1990, a jet was flying into Anchorage, Alaska, 747, flew into an ash cloud that had been erupted by Mount Readout. All four engines got coated with melted ash. All four engines shut off at 30,000 feet. Plane full of people, now has no jet engines working. It plummets out of the sky. The jet engines shut down. So if the jet engines shut down, they stop producing heat. They cool off really quickly as they're plummeting, and all that melted material then hardens quickly to a glass. So as it's plummeting out of the sky, the melted material that shut down the jet engine turns to glass. The pilots are frantically trying to start their engines, and actually right before they hit the ground, they manage to get two engines restarted. The turbines would turn and it would break up all that glassy material, and they eventually got two of the engines to stay on, and they were able to limp into Anchorage, and no one died. But I imagine it was a pretty messy flight with um, everybody losing their bowels as they thought they were going to die on that thing. Had to be just a horrible experience. The problem with volcanic ash is that until just very recently, it didn't show up on radar. Pilots would have no idea that there was an ash cloud out there. And they'd just fly into this ash cloud. It would stink like sulfur. Their engines would shut off. And in most cases, they were lucky and didn't perish. Now we've upgraded all of our radar systems worldwide. There's now sensitive enough to pick up volcanic ash clouds and divert pilots around them. And it's a problem we don't deal with as much anymore. Okay, so we have lava flows. Molten material that comes out of the ground flows away from the vent. We have lava domes. Molten material that's super sticky that comes out and can't flow very far and sort of piles up into a dome-shaped structure in one place. We have horizontal explosions, these ash columns that go way up into the stratosphere, carry ash great distances that can fall out. We have the horizontal explosions, the pyroclastic flows, the really deadly activity. But interestingly, what kills the most people is probably the one people think about the least in terms of stuff that comes out of the volcano, and that's volcanic mud flows. The Indonesians call these lahars. They're basically a mix of water and ash that was erupted from a volcano. The reason they're so deadly is that they can travel great distances. Some mud flows can travel 100 miles or more from the volcano. And they can happen well after the volcano stops erupting. The thing, too, is that they're basically floods of mud. So they follow the river valleys. But when they come to rest, unlike water, the water just sort of flows away and you're left with the river valley that you had there before. With a mud flow, when the mud flow goes in, the mud stays. So it fills up the river valleys. So where does the next mud flow go? It goes somewhere else. The next one goes somewhere else. The next one goes somewhere else. And what they do is they just sort of blanket 
an entire area, even areas that prior to that eruption weren't really affected by streams or floods or anything. So this material chokes all the streams for great distances from the volcano. This house right here um, was about 30 miles from Mount St. Helens. So when Mount St. Helens erupted, it was in May, there was still a lot of snow. There were glaciers on the mountain. All the heat from the eruption melted those glaciers, picked up all that ash and sent it down the river valleys. And it buried a number of homes in the river valleys part way up. Some were completely buried. What do you do if your house gets buried by a mud flow? You really have two options, right? You can move, but you still own the land, right? You still own this place if you bought the house. What a lot of people did is they ended up tearing down the damaged structure and putting up a new home. Sadly, two years after Mount St. Helens first erupted, there was another smaller eruption that again melted snow and ice and sent another mud flow down and several people ended up losing their second home in two years to Mount St. Helens. So again, mud flows can occur well after the volcano stops erupting. They can happen for decades actually near some sites of really large eruptions. So they travel a great distance. You don't have to have continuing eruptions to produce continuing mud flows. You just need the material that came out of one eruption along with some water that can pick this material up. Okay. So kind of refreshing where we are. We have magma, melted material, solid minerals, gas and xenoliths. We have two main types of magma, mafic and silicic. Mafic has a low silica content. Lots of gas can escape because it's fluid and you get lava flows. With silicic magma, you have lots of silica. It's thick and pasty. Gases can escape, so you tend to get explosions. Not surprisingly, the two magma types can result in volcanoes that look really different. Yeah, question. Pyroclastic surges and flows are very similar. Um, a pyroclastic surge, you know how I talked about a pyroclastic flow having an avalanche at the base and then kind of a cloud that sits above it where all the rocks are banging together and the ash gets carried out? That top cloud is called the surge. And sometimes what will happen is a pyroclastic flow will be going down a river valley and there'll be a bend in the river valley so it'll take the bend, but that light cloud will actually just keep going over the ridge tops. And that's called a pyroclastic surge. So it's related to a pyroclastic flow. It's just a little more dilute, but it's every bit as deadly. You can even argue it's more deadly because it's not as constrained by topography as pyroclastic flows are. Okay, I mentioned earlier in the class, two magma types. One's very fluid, produces lava flows. Because those lava flows are fluid, they can travel a great distance. A volcano erupting that material is gonna produce a volcano that looks very different from one that produces ash. So in this first case, we have something called a shield volcano. It's sort of named for a warrior shield lying flat on the ground. So you can think of it as kind of a low, sort of broadly sloping hump. It doesn't really, if you ask somebody to draw a volcano, they probably wouldn't draw this. It's not steep and symmetrical. It's really low. The slopes are only a couple of degrees, maybe one to three degrees. So it looks like a gently slope, big broad cone. Think of a shield tipped over lying on the ground. And the reason it has this shape is because it's made of mafic magma. Mafic magma is fluid. The lava flows that are produced are runny. They can travel a great distance before they harden and come to rest. 
so the material is able to flow far from the vent. It doesn't pile up in one spot. It kind of covers the countryside. It'll be a little thicker near the vent and thinner farther out, but it's not a big pile close to the vent. So that photo in the background, that is Mauna Loa in Hawaii. And you can see that it's sort of a broadly sloping cone, right? That particular volcano is actually the tallest mountain on Earth. When you ask people, what's the tallest mountain on Earth? Everybody says Mount Everest, 29,000 plus feet. It's not technically correct. Mauna Loa is 13,000 feet high, but it sits in 17,000 feet of ocean water. And this volcano extends down to the ocean and then extends all the way down to the ocean floor. It's a couple hundred miles wide. It's a huge mountain. And when you take the 17,000 feet of volcano that's buried by ocean and add to it the 13,000 feet that sits above the ocean, this particular mountain is over 30,000 feet high. So it's kind of a matter of how you want to measure things. If you measure Mount Everest from the base, the base of Mount Everest is somewhere around 17,000 feet. So that mountain is only about 12,000 feet high. This mountain, although it might not attain the same elevation as Everest, it's actually much taller. And if you look closely at this photo that I have up, you can see some darker lava flows. The darker ones tend to be the more recent lava flows. As time goes on and it gets rained on and plants start to grow, they tend to take on a lighter color. But you can see there these dark lava flows and you see how far they're traveling. A lot of these lava flows travel many, many miles. Because they're so fluid, they can move quick. They can get away before they harden and become solid rock. That's really different than the type of volcano that's produced by the second magma type, which is silicic. Silicic magma tends to create a volcano that we call a stratovolcano. Strato for strata. These tend to be alternating layers of explosive material like ash and short stubby lava flows or domes and one just sort of piles up on the other piles up on the other piles up on the other stratovolcanoes are the most common kind of volcano that we have on continents shield volcanoes are the most common kind of volcano that we have in ocean environments this particular volcano that you see here this is a stratovolcano in Italy. That's what Mount Vesuvius looks like today. And you can see how much human activity has settled around Mount Vesuvius. So the Naples area, which you see here, has two to three million people now. And Vesuvius has a long history of being active, explosive, and deadly. You had the AD 79 eruption, which, if it had happened today, would greatly impact a lot of the people that you see in this photo. There was an eruption back in the 40s. It's much smaller than the one in AD 79. But a large eruption there today would impact a lot of people. It's, I think, generally regarded as one of the top three potentially deadliest volcanoes on Earth. Another one is Mount Rainier here in the United States outside the cities of Seattle and Tacoma. Mount Rainier has a long history of sending big, powerful mud flows. In fact, the Tacoma Airport sits on a volcanic mud flow from Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier is over 14,000 feet high. So these mud flows can really get a running start down the volcano and travel great distances. So where volcanoes and human populations come together, you can have extreme risk. Naples is one area scientists are concerned about. Seattle, Tacoma area, another area where people are really concerned. Another stratovolcano there, that's Mount Mayon in the Philippines. Erupts every few years. Here's a photo of it between eruptions. 
you can see kind of the perfectly symmetrical shape to it, alternating layers of ash and short stubby lava flows. I think if you ask most people, draw a volcano, they draw something that looks like this rather than a shield volcano, even though shield volcanoes are technically more common on Earth. They just happen to be in ocean environments where we can't see them. All right, if you're writing your notes, I'm gonna give you a second to write this down. This slide sort of puts everything together we've talked about. So I'll just sit back for a minute and let those of you taking notes do this because it's much easier for you to understand if I talk through it once the notes are in your notebook rather than having you write. Okay, this slide is sort of designed to put everything together that we've talked about so far. So it starts out with the environment that the volcano is forming in, which we have on the left, and it ultimately ends up with the type of volcano that you see on the Earth's surface on the far right. And then in the middle are sort of all the steps involved and how we go from one to the other. So let's say we are in an oceanic environment. Think back to plate tectonics. Ocean crust is very thin, right? It's only a couple miles thick. On average, ocean crust is about four miles thick. That means the mantle is really close to the Earth's surface. From earthquakes, we know that in these oceanic environments that we are melting the mantle and that that magma is coming up to the surface. So in oceanic environments, we melt the mantle. When you melt the mantle, you get a magma that is low in silica and very runny. That's called mafic magma. That's just what you get when you melt the mantle. When you melt the mantle, you end up with mafic magma. Mafic magma has a low silica content, doesn't have much internal bonding. That means it's very runny. So any gas that you have in can escape easy. Since the gas escapes, you don't have the necessary ingredients to create an explosion. Instead, you get lava flows. These lava flows, again, are made of really runny fluid material. So they can travel a great distance. And when you have lava flows spreading out all over the countryside, not piling up in one spot, you tend to create this broad, gently sloping mountain called a shield volcano. In the second case, we have a continental environment. On continental environments, the mantle is really deep, 30 to 50 miles down. Really difficult for anything originating in the mantle to get to the Earth's surface unchanged. So what you end up doing is getting material that ends up originating in the continent itself. So this is melting of continental material. When you melt that material, you get a magma that has a different chemistry than when you melt the mantle. It's higher in silica. Because it's higher in silica, it has more strong bonds. It's more viscous, thick and pasty. Gases can escape. So this material, when it arrives at the surface, retains all of its gas. That creates tremendous explosions that rip the magma apart or it might create short stubby lava flows that don't travel very far. So you get alternating layers of ash, these short stubby lava flows that give you this steep-sided, somewhat symmetrical stratovolcano.
All right, any questions on that? Let me see what I got left. All right, I'm just going to cover this super quick because everybody asks about Yellowstone. I got called by a billionaire last semester, a California billionaire who wanted to move to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, but he was afraid to move because of Yellowstone. So I talked to him for an hour and told him not to worry about it. And you shouldn't worry about Yellowstone. Past eruptions of Yellowstone, the big eruption everybody's worried about, there's usually 10,000 to 50,000 years of smaller eruptions that lead up to it. We haven't even started those yet. So I'm not worried about Yellowstone. Yellowstone is a certain type of volcano called a caldera. A caldera is formed by a volcanic eruption that is so large that so much material comes out of the ground that the ground above it collapses into the void that was vacated by all the magma that erupted. So it's basically a big crater in the ground. It's such a large eruption that the volcano falls in on itself. And there's been a lot of examples. Crater Lake, Oregon, Santorini, Greece, Mount uh, Yellowstone's actually had many of these in the past. We've had some more recent ones. Mount Pinatubo, you saw the video. That was a caldera eruption. You saw how big it was, how much mess it made. And that was kind of a small caldera by historical standards. There's one in Mount Chile in 1991. So these things do happen on occasion. That's Crater Lake, Oregon. Used to be a probably a 14,000 foot high volcano. Huge eruption 6,000 years ago. The whole top of the volcano collapsed into itself, forming this crater lake. And then that island in the middle was from some subsequent activity that's occurred since then. If you haven't been to Crater Lake, go. It's a really impressive place. This is Yellowstone. I don't know how many of you have been to Yellowstone and driven around the park. If you have, you know how big the park is. It's huge. Well, this dotted red line is the outline of the area that collapsed during the last great eruption. It takes up most of the park. And in fact, if you put that caldera here, it would extend from campus all the way to the Denver airport. It's huge, it's enormous. So the amount of material that had to come out for this to collapse was also enormous. The amount of material that came out of Yellowstone was about 2,500 times more than what came out of Mount St. Helens in 1980. So that's why they call these things super eruptions, even though I really hate that term. So here's just some data. I don't care if you write this down, but Yellowstone erupted 2 million years ago, 1.3 million years ago, and 600,000 years ago. Okay, math whizzes. What's the time between each of these eruptions? I'll answer it for you. 700,000 years. How long has it been since the last eruption? 600,000 years. That means we're entering that window when we might expect Yellowstone to start acting up. That's why people are somewhat concerned. Will it erupt in our lifetime? I seriously doubt it. If it does, it's not likely to be the big eruption because the big eruptions in the past, these ones I have up here on the slide, usually are preceded by tens of thousands of years of smaller eruptions. That doesn't mean that the next eruption's gonna go exactly the way the other ones did, but as geologists, that's all we have to go on. It's really unlikely, I think, that Volcanoes like Yellowstone will just suddenly blow themselves to pieces with no warning at all. Occasionally that can happen, but typically not with these great eruptions. And you can see the data. Mount Krakatoa is probably the most famous recent caldera. It occurred in 1883. It's an Indonesian island. Eruption was so great that the island collapsed into the sea. And when it did, it sent a tidal wave around the Southern Ocean twice killed 36,000 people in Southeast Asia. It was reported to be the loudest sound ever on earth. They heard it in India, several thousand miles away. So these things are big and powerful. 
And I put Mount St. Helens up there for a comparison. Mount St. Helens didn't collapse into itself. It just sort of blew itself to pieces. These other ones were much bigger. Krakatoa, 20 times bigger. Crater Lake, 40 times bigger. Long Valley's another caldera in California, 600 times bigger. And then Yellowstone. The biggest one ever on Earth was probably here in Colorado, down in the San Juans. It created a deposit that was about 3,000 cubic kilometers, or about three times bigger than Mount St. Helens. That's the biggest one we know of. But that occurred tens of millions of years ago. The chance of that occurring today is basically nil. All right, that's all I got for you. I hope you guys uh, enjoy the rest of your semester. If you have any questions, please let me know.